morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever time of day it is. Thank you for tuning in to Conversations with Dr. Don. This show is produced and broadcast from Portland, Oregon, USA. And for your first time viewers, Conversations with Dr. Don is an ongoing series of one hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people like most of you out there about who they are as unique one of a kind individuals and about whatever it is that we have decided to talk about. And we'll be talking about uh, topical issues as of January 20th, 2016. And Jimmy knows a lot about topical issues and all kinds of other stuff. Good heavens. Because <laughs> he's been on my show how many times in the last 16 years? I have not been able to count them. <laughs> <laughs> and it's always good to have you back again. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. It's a pleasure. How are you feeling right now? I'm a little nervous. Not as nervous as I usually is because I've gotten so used to I've run across them to your face. Thank you. If you ask me a question, I always, since the question, how are you, I'll give you an answer. A, a, I'll give you a Shakespearean answer. Oh, yes, of course. You tell us about what G that... Given my background. Yes. Like to the time of the year between the extreme of hot and cold, mm -hmm. neither, neither sad nor happy. So, fine. <laughs> There's a lot more of that coming out there, and you'll love it. I do. <laughs> As you know, the first half of the show is going to be talking about who you are personally, even though you've done it a thousand times. There will be viewers who have not seen you before, so we'll cover it probably not as deep as before, but enough. That's fine. That's fine. Because I'm going to ask you about what you've been up to uh, since the last time you were on the show, which was yesterday, I think. Uh, <laughs> 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 that, would, that, would have been, that would have been an exaggeration. Let me, let me, how have I done this since then? Oh, um, very much run of the mill things. As, as you know, as, uh, I'm also a producer on the, <coughs> on the station, or actually on the TVC TV station. Mm -hmm. And for the last <coughs> two years, I have <coughs> produced a program which is called Historical Sketches, which defines itself by the title. And uh, it is going on. I do it about uh, twice, uh, once a month with two episodes. Mm -hmm. The last ones, the last ones, where one uh, called the Water of the Roses, uh, which many people may not be dramatically interested in, but it is, it is still something which affected and how did the that European go? How history. How did that show go? It's tough for me to say because, <laughs> because after a finish, <laughs> however, they are online. But I, I, I measure by the number of visitors also by the other station who pick it up. Pick it up. Mm -hmm. And the other one, I mentioned this because the last one was actually was in the history of Libya. And uh, I divided the, sh the, the sketch, which is 28 minutes, uh, in two sections. The first part is actual history, you know, the, this and that, what happened in Libya and why and when and how. It was it called that way. Libya and North Africa. Libya and North Africa. Mm -hmm. And the second section was a, uh, is a, uh, a trailer of a movie made by an Italian producer, a documentary, who happened to be in Libya when they lynched and when they the coalition of the co co coalition of the evil uh, assassinated uh, Gaddafi, and he was also in Iraq when uh, in 2003 when they started bombing. So he has quite a good experience. So I I put on the show the trailer, which is about 14 minutes, and I I uh, dubbed the um, Italian the, since he's an Italian producer, I dubbed the Italian into English so people can see can see what what is going on. And you got permission to do that? Oh, he, he, he asked, well, no, he asked me. Yes, yes, he, is, uh, he was very pleased. Uh -huh. In fact, we have a um, semi-idea of working together on some of his documentaries. Okay. And I wonder, it, uh, as you were saying that, I thought about Gaddafi. What do you think of Gaddafi? What do you think of him? Oh, it's, <laughs> it depends. Uh, judgments on people, events, facts, and whatnot, num even numbers, are a function of the ideology, as you probably agree. Of course. So um, the the ideology that has prompted the his destruction exp speaks by itself. But when you come to factual matters, um, the uh, Gaddafi as well as a Saddam Hussein were the actually opposite of everything that's been said about them. In the instance of um, 
of Gaddafi, which is also reported in, is also shown in, in that particular trailer. Are you on the Homeland Security watch list with those kinds of things you're saying? I don't know, but I'm, quite, I'm, I'm remarkably harmless, so except for what I say, so I'm, I don't think I'm insulting anyone because this is the truth. Yeah. So there were a, a number of, um, there was a number of um, uh, initiatives aimed directly at the people which made, as everybody knows, mm -hmm. Libya the most advanced, most economically prosperous, and most socially equal, if you like, uh, country in Africa. Mm -hmm. For example, yeah. universal health care, bonus for the house, bonus for the firstborn, for the, for, for the children, mm -hmm. um, uh, sick, uh, maternity sick leave paid, a free education to the university level, uh, yes, and a number of other initiatives, some of which have gone in the background because of the destruction but, for example, the uh, construction of a canal that brought the fresh water from the, from the only p place where it, where, it, uh, where it rains, which is near the coast, to, down into, in, into, into the interior of the, at least of the Sahara. So creating a significant, a significant boost in local agriculture and self-sufficiency as far as food is concerned. So from that point of view, if you, rec if you regard that, of he, whoever regards that as a totalitarian initiative, I'm quite pleased to say if I, that were the way I don't mind to be with under the totalitarian regime. But that's that, not because, just, just for, for, for pure logic. And that is true. So. Well, let me ask you a few questions from my usual format here. Sure, so people sure. get an idea a little more where you're coming from. Uh, uh, if I asked your best friend, who is Jimmy, what would your best friend say? Be your best friend. Jimmy is what? Oh, so my best friend is Don Bam. Okay. But, <laughs> <laughs> what would I say? Uh, this, the, my best friend to me, yeah. I am so, I'm so uncertain. I would just wouldn't know. But uh, it's a question, it's one of your quest, tricky questions uh -huh. for which I really have no answer. Yeah. What, you're asking what, what was, why would, what would my best friend say of me, are you saying? Mm -hmm. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, well, if, be, if your best friend was saying Jimmy is what? Someone not necessarily to be associated with. <laughs> <laughs> Say that again. Unless, <laughs> unless somebody is a masochist. No, I'm exaggerating. Well, I would say run of the mill with some, with some peculiarities, really remarkably harmless. And I think that would suffice because otherwise we go into a biographical, into a biographical that's extension. That's the purpose of the question. Oh, well, that's yeah. a, <laughs> for for instance, someone might say, uh, talking about Don Bam. I'm gonna pre pretend so you've asked me the question. Well, Don Bam is kind of unusual. He's kind of peculiar in his tendencies and his thinking. He's, he's not usual, he's not ordinary. He's interesting, he's attentive, and he's a caring human being. That's one of the things I like about him. So that's a, a model, and I've done this so many times. You know, I've yeah, got all kinds I see. of well, I examples. I, I do not disagree with your self-assessment, and I do not disagree with mine. <laughs> <laughs> and you said, uh, good friend, the best friend, and I felt good what you said about uh, me. Well, well, yes, well, regarding myself, I, don't know. I would say the people who know me are the best judges of how they can describe me, but I don't, I don't feel particularly different, nor particularly the same, so <laughs> in the between. I, I admire you very, very much. I admire um, you very, very much, in, I'm addition, bereft, in addition to liking you. I'm bereft of words, as Shakespeare would say. <laughs> <laughs> and when and where were you born? Remember that question? Before I was born in Turin. Turin. As far when, let me put it, let me see what I can say. Uh, can you think me back put, that far? Yeah, I could, well, I could, well, maybe. Let me, see, let, let me put it this way. Yes. I, still run, I may still run after women, but no longer remember why. <laughs> <laughs> that isn't from Shakespeare. No. <laughs> uh, oh, why were you born, Jimmy? A question that would be better, uh, would better ask of my parents, who unfortunately are no longer in this world. 
I don't know whether it was a good idea or not, but they are the best ones to decide. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how, okay, uh, cultural uh, 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 national heritage. Any uh, comments about that aspect of, of who Jimmy is? Yes, I, I was born in Italy, uh, which is uh, uh, in Italy, and I went to school in Italy. I grew up in a bilingual uh, situation, so I grew up speaking Italian and French. Italian and French? Yes. Uh -huh. And uh, then after my, I, uh, my first job was, I was a musician as, at, the, at the, my first job and um, actually a singing guitarist. And um, after several years of doing that... You were singing? Uh, oh, yeah. I think I told you last time. I, I was a country and western singer. So, and I, in fact, those who are so inclined, and I not necessarily encourage it, but if they go to my website and go and receive my email, I even put my, my what I call son et lumière, uh, sound and uh, light, um, New Year's wishes, where the, it's done, was done in, in a kitchen, a type of kitchen in the studio, <laughs> but still, they can see how I play, how I sing, and, and there is, an, I, for, for, the, for the, my international, quote, friends, I put pictures of Oregon. Then I made one for the uh, Italian Americans with pictures of Italy, so there are two versions there, but the music is the same. The singing is the same, the guitar is the same, the studio is the same. Are you still playing nowadays? For, yes, every now and then, when just it's a little bit sad because uh, things come back to the mind. Uh, uh, friends that I played with, uh, various various groups, a couple of years ago, uh, a friend of mine with whom we were playing came to see me here uh, from Italy, and uh, we had a nice time together, remembering our oh, yeah. cruises. We played many cruises, and uh, I think I told you last time we played. We were one of the first group to play in Russia, so we played in Odessa in the Alta, in Sochi, and um, so it was, that was one of them, but you know, we went around the Mediterranean and, and in the coast of Africa, so we went to all sorts of places. You're so full of so many interesting stories. You know where are you ordinary, and I'm, I missed if you told me what year you were born in or how old you are now. As I, as I said before, I may still run after women, but no longer remember why, and just leave it on that. Okay. <laughs> are you available for some woman who's watching this show now? Oh, I'm available for, for all sorts of things, but I would like to not talk about No comment about that, huh? Okay. I have two sons. Uh -huh. um, one is here in Portland. The other is working in Berlin, Germany. He right was, now? Yeah, he was here for the vacation. What's he doing? He is internet marketing specialist for a high-precision watch company. <laughs> I shouldn't make you advertising, <laughs> but they gave me a watch for Christmas. He's, I, and I, it was news for me because new, uh, new to me because I know little about watches. But there is a, this particular company is um, making these high precision watches in a small town in what now was before the DDR, the, the um, uh, East Germany, which is called Glashütte, the, the the town. So the, the name of the company is also Nomos Glashütte. Yeah, and did, did you ever have a religious preference and do you have one now? Like oh. most people born where I was, uh, I, was I grew up a Catholic, which was a good, uh, a good recipe for becoming an agnostic. <laughs> Or a good, a good prelude to becoming an agnostic. Been there, so, done that. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. However, I, I respect all the religions. And again, since we are in the theme of, or rather, in the, considering nostalgic elements uh, of, of, of our life, I, I remember with some fondness the, um, the friars I was with because they were kind, not only to me, but everyone. They taught me some Latin without meaning, and they taught me to sing, which, which is one of the reasons why I started singing. And so, I, in, from that point of view, I should be grateful to them. So, so that's the end. Any remnants of your Catholic upbringing because of this new Pope, Pope Francis? 
I have become, see, at the time, I believe everything I was told. We, we, we live in a patriarchal system, you see, so as you, you agree, still do. And so uh, the child is taught to respect the family, the father, and above the father there is the, well, the, the, little, the, man, the invisible man in the sky. So I never, I never, if the question was what I remember of them, or um, what was the question? Uh, you asked uh, me if I remember something about. You, well, you think about uh, Catholicism now, considering oh. the new pope, and I probably didn't put Did the question no, that's that, okay. quite like that. I, I really, I don't have an opinion. I'm very skeptical about the uh, political aspect of the church, but of course I am not an expert, and so I couldn't say. But the, I am skeptical because of everything that uh, goes on in the Catholic Church. And by the way, one of the, one of the sketches that I'm preparing to, besides the one I told you at the beginning before the show, I am preparing a sketch on the Borgia family, which are the, who gave the Pope Alexander VI of the 1500. It was a, several things happened at the, in, through the first, the last decade of the, the 1500, the first two decades of the 1600. And this Pope one was the most corrupt uh, in the history of the church. <laughs> so um, I'm not saying that this Pope is corrupt, but the more one, the more one, probably I'm sure he isn't, but the more one delves into the history of the church and compares the teaching with the actual programs and with the actual happenings, um, the, the, the uh, level of skepticism tends to rise. So <laughs> that is, uh, I don't know what to say. Yeah. And how about your formal education? Oh, I, I can boast, which is probably the right word to boast. I can boast of a degree in engineering um, uh, in, uh, in the University of Genoa uh, with the, the usual accoutrement of theses and so forth, and which was what led me to come to Portland as well as my, at the time, um, perception that this would be the place where the music, which at the time I did like, would, was born, which it was not. But anyway, give me the, the background was that. So I, that's how through the, uh, through the degree in engineering, I got a job to a local, with a local company here, large company. Mm -hmm. How about additional education? Self, completely self-taught. Mm -hmm. Well, I could number the... If I were to rewrite my resume, I could put course on this, course on that. Most of them are useless, but most of the, most of the things that I believe one can learn are self-taught. Mm -hmm. uh, and you said a few things about what you're doing uh, any, recently in, in, in terms of a regular job. You don't have that. No, I retired. Uh, a few years ago, or rather, I changed, I changed the flag of my activity, if that's a good metaphor, and I became a writer. And uh, I do st still write. I, I've now, I'm close to my fi 500th article on the website, yourdailyshakespeare.com. Mm. And yesterday, yesterday, just because it ha just happens, uh, the Statistics clocked 170,000 visitors in the first, yesterday. So oh my god! This is in three years, so it's not dramatic. But um, so every now and then, there is a, a much bigger blogger than blog than I am that picks up my articles, or they picked up some of the um, historical sketches, particularly the one that I did in six in six installments, so to speak, uh, about the history of Ukraine. And uh, that got me thousands and thousands of visitors, including some that say it's all wrong, and some that say it's very good. So, as you know, opinions vary. <laughs> <laughs> and we talked in the past about the continuum of, of education and learnings and IQ and those kinds of things. And I'm never measured by IQ because I'm afraid it will be not as much as I think it is. But. Um, I think that self-interest in things is um, uh, generally interesting. Things is a good a good place to start from, and in order to acquire 
what are called information, whatever. Engineer, musician, singer, and all those kinds musician of things. Musician and singer should not be separately because they sing guitar. When I, when I grew up, there were very few people who did not play the guitar and very few people who didn't sing. Mm -hmm. But um, I, for a while, I thought I would continue on the line. And then I said, well, I spent all these years stu uh, studying all this stuff. Why did I do it? And so I, I decided to continue and temporarily, as I say, hang the instrument on the wall. How about uh, just w one bit of your favorite aria? <laughs> exactly. I have, a, a, I, I have a, a significant allergy to opera, which I did not like. And, and so that w I would be not the one to display that. And I, I should have brought my instrument. Which I, they didn't have intention to do, even if you asked me. But uh, as I said, people can go on the site and get my Christmas wishes. And, sure. And uh, so they can judge by themselves. But anyway, that's, that's enough. All right. But par partly because, you see, opera, opera is, um, for those who like opera, I'm glad for them, and no problem. But opera was a manifestation of a time, particularly the, end, the 19th, 19th century and the beginning of the 20th, when there were no loudspeakers. So you needed, you needed people with enormous lungs in order to create this volume so that everybody in the theater could hear them. But when you go so, when you, with this beautiful voice, beautiful, extremely powerful voice, they you don't know, require amplification, what happens is that it's very difficult to explain, the, to convey or transmit the feelings that go with the music. So from that point of view, it didn't ever strike me cold. No, I didn't like, I saw a few, but didn't just like too much. It's beautiful, very well done. I like the overtures, yes. The overtures, yes. But uh, the, the opera itself never been much fond of. Let's say, uh, uh, say a few words about uh, the books you've written. Yes, I've written, uh, pu published three. Uh, one is called, a, I feel I'm a, a record, the old type record that now is no longer the only find in antiquary shops. But anyway, the first one is a, a useful, unusual and unique uh, dictionary of Shakespeare, um, which is called... Is that uh, the one that's about eight inches thick? Yes. Well, eight <laughs> inches is a bit an exaggeration, but close enough. <laughs> uh, your daily Shakespeare, an arsenal of verbal weapons to drive your friends into action and your enemies into despair. <laughs> and uh, then the, on the strength of that, I then did the same treatment, quote-unquote, creating then or writing a dictionary of the Divine Comedy, which was published by the government of Tuscany. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the other one that I've written, published, is, <coughs> is the history of the United States in Italian for the Italian audience, which, which, um, um, has, a, <laughs> which has a somewhat mischievous, mischievous, not to say... Uh, you mischievous? No, the title is. <laughs> I'm mischievous by definition, but the title is mischievous. Because USA in, uh, in Italian is the imperative or the verb to use. Mm -hmm. So if you, in <laughs> the title is Use and Dispose, a, a counter history of the United States. How is that? Like, remember Howard Zinn's history of the Yes, States? I could say Howard Zinn was one of the inspirer, but in order not to plagiarize, I have. Uh, the actually the um, bibliography, fortunately, on the history of the United States is enormous, so it is quite possible to extract from from various sources, books, documents, etc., sufficient information to make it adequately unique, so that you can say, "Oh no, this this is a slightly different, or at least a slightly different point of view from the others." But of course, Howard Zinn is the trailblazer of this type of um, uh, ideas as far as the United States, the history of the United States are concerned. Mm -hmm. And you uh, don't have uh, a companion, a wife, a girlfriend, or anything like that? 
I have a cat, and I live with a cat. So I, I'm, no, I, well, I, I know I have, I, I know uh, people and uh, good, very good friends. I have some very good friends, uh -huh. but I live on my own. How close are you to your cat? I like all animals, and I'm a vegetarian, you see, actually, I'm a vegan. Um, I would say the, the cat, the felines, yes, cats in particular, yes, yes. Have, a, have an extraordinary sense of humor. And really? that's why I... <laughs> I've never heard that said before. Oh, no, no, no. The cat is an extraordinary sense of humor. So, and that's one of the reasons why I always liked them, ever since I was a little boy. Sometimes when we have another three hours, I want you to tell me about your cat's sense of humor. What's his or her name? Uh, her name betrays her name betrays my uh, political leanings. Her name is Chavette, and it comes from Hugo Chavez, and that came about because my son, the one who is now in Berlin, found these two kittens in one of those places where the kittens are feral feral cats. So he brought them home, uh, and so he wanted to call one Hugo, and he wanted to call one Hugo and the other one Chavez except that we found that both were females. So we, one, the little one, Hugo, or Huget, uh, somehow s slipped away from the uh, box that my son t would take with him, s him at the office to have the cat with him. And, um, and the other one remained, Chavez, so Chavez male, Chavez, Chavez female. When Chavez was still alive, I was planning to, I didn't ever did it, I was, said, we like you so much that we even called our cat after you, but that, I don't know whether it would have been interpreted by his associates in, a, in, a, in the sense that I thought he should have interpreted it. So. <laughs> uh, we're going to take a break in a couple of minutes, but uh, uh, memberships in political, or social, or civic organizations, any memberships worth mentioning? Yes, um, I am the unworthy for the second year and probably the last president of the Tuscan Association of Oregon. And I'm not, um, I'm quite glad to, to, uh, to um, make a point, or rather, to talk about it, to advertise it, because it's a, this is the 20th year of the organization, uh, of the Tuscan Association, which was founded by a gentleman who lives in Salem by the name of Carlo Mannocci. We have a good audience, and uh, it's a cultural association, which culture is a term which embraces everything from history to cuisine, to food, to music, to um, literature. Yeah. And uh, we meet once a month um, in, at the, um, in one of the halls connected, to the, connected with the St. Philip Neri Church. And, um, and we have about 80, 100 members, and uh, we do good things for, in, for people who are interested in Italian culture. What about the third book? You didn't tell me what the third book's about. I told you. Well, there was one about Shakespeare, yes. one about Dante, uh, oh, okay. and, the, you know, and the history of the United States in Italian. I've written others that have not been published. Yeah. You forget my age. I don't no, remember. No, 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 no. I just, I mean, you, well, no. When it comes to listing, one should go one, two, and three, which I didn't do that. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, one last question. Uh, people uh, from the past or alive today that you particularly admire or look up to? Any names come to mind? For yes, you? there is one American uh, mm -hmm. that I do like. I think before, I think the president, Jimmy Carter, is one of my favorite Americans, and I'm very glad that he is still uh, active uh, in what he does. I have great admiration for, for him, for everything that he did, for everything that he stands for, and I still maintain that he had he remained a president, uh, we would have a very different country today. Uh, anybody else come to mind that you admire or look up to? That's either the pet gone now or alive anymore. Um, Don't tell yes. me Donald Trump. No, <laughs> no, I, I wouldn't say I, I would have. I would hesitate to say that I would admire him. But um, I would say that in the past, Bertrand Russell has been one of my inspiring thoughts. Me uh, too. And um, inspiring writer and philosophers. And then, if I have a go, the list will be extremely long because I, I find the, the, the literature, both ancient, classical, and uh, even contemporary, some anyway 
is full of people that have said interesting things in a good way and in an elegant way, which of the two go together. And so I would say the movie list would be too long, would be annoying your your audience too much. You could never annoy my audience. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think you're mistaken, but that's it. <laughs> Let's take a break, uh, Mr. Director, and then we're going to go into whatever else Jimmy wants to talk about. Hello, we are back again, and thanks for staying tuned. And for you viewers who missed the opening of the show, Conversations with Dr. Don that you're watching is an ongoing series of one-hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people like most of you out there about who they are as unique, one-of-a-kind individuals and about whatever it is we've decided to talk about tonight, and Jimmy Mowgli, my guest, and I are talking about topical issues on this day, January 20th, 2016, and we spent the first half hour talking about who Jimmy is, and that's been deucedly interesting in its own right, but we should talk about some other things too, Jimmy, okay? You decide. Uh, anything comes to mind now that seems more topical than other things that you would like to talk about? <laughs> then, uh, the, then the theologians of the 13th century, yes. Um, well, because you asked me, and I think um, it is relevant to what I'm doing, and I think that from there we can go into subjects which are relevant to today. Yes. As I was mentioning in the first half, and uh, I, produce, I produce a program called Historical Sketches, which every time changes, and of course. And uh, the, I've become recently interested in the uh, in in uh, Joseph Stalin in Stalin which is a which is a radioactive territory as far as the United <laughs> States but lest lest I may mislead uh, with the um, mislead the audience this is not because I want is a revisionist history of history sure. but it's one of those first of all there is a revival of interest in Stalin in Europe and not really? only in uh, Western Europe, but even in Eastern Europe. Secondly, uh, I, party, I get my information. I no longer watch television <laughs> except Downton Abbey. <laughs> but, um, so I get, most of us, including myself, get information from the internet these days. So, and if they offer such a variety of, uh, of opinions and voices, and uh, there is a resurgence of interest in Stalin. In both in the ex in in Germany, both in the West and the East, really, particularly in some of the uh, blog, there are some blogs that I follow. There are people who have compared the there are, at least the statistics say that of the people who lived in the DDR and the East German Republic before and after the uh, uh, unification with Germany. 75% uh, say that they were living better before. <laughs> so Really, under Stalin? Uh, no, that would be under the... Uh, East Germany was not under Stalin. Of course. By oh, East you're Germany. talking about Germany but now. I was, <clears throat> I was saying that the interest in Stalin also reflects this revision, this rather revision of statistics, which show that it's not everything as good as it seems based on the um, mainstream media or whatever, on the um, narrative, which is used to describe Germany today. But in um, the other interest in, 
the revival of Stalin is also occurring in the Soviet, in the ex-Soviet Union in Russia. Okay. And um, as I mentioned, it's about some radioactive territory because in moment, in moment if, you, if you try to say something good about such mm. a person or something, or some not good, but something different, not different, and different. Uh, the impression is, ah, maybe this is a crypto communist. Not at all. I have uh, no. But I think that uh, history, um, as we is, history is is continually continuously evolving, and the history is always new because each each historian, when he writes about a subject, he brings with himself the ideas and the visions and the perceptions and the judgments that he casts on the time when he is living at the moment. Whether he wants to or not. Whether he wants to or not. So I don't think it's improper for to study this, to study the Stalin, also because I knew very little about it, but about him. And uh, but it was a very interesting personality uh, in his own in his own uh, in his own merit. To begin with, there are some things that people know but they don't put together. He was a Georgian. He was born in Georgia, which mm -hmm. was one of the republic of the of the uh, Soviet Union. Yes, a Soviet Union. If I if I'm not mistaken, I think it about eleven or so republic. But within these republics, there were um, ethnic entities. So there are about still today, through still excluding Ukraine and excluding uh, the these the 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 republic which were dissolved. To do a, when um, when Yeltsin uh, did that or whatever, when it happened in the 1991, there are about 80 ethnic nationalities. So it wasn't it wasn't all that easy, but it was it happened that they were able to for a long time to maintain ethnic harmony between all these people, including these countries like Ukraine, um, Georgia. Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, and all the other ones. How would he manage to do this? And here is where the, first of all, Stalin covers the initial period. He died in 1953. Um, there were, uh, he, they, we say, managed to do it yes. through a, um, particularly after, particularly, let's say, following the last purge, which was in 1955 or so. Um, by enacting what I call constitutions that would provide for the the ethnic requirements of this of the various groups. For example, last year I got from the library because it was extremely it's a huge huge tome about Islam in the Soviet Union, mm. and that was very interesting. It was written by not not by a Russian, so he was not communist, actually, he was, he was an Israeli, for the, uh, Jewish. So it was very well documented and written. Um, as you know, and you, most of us remember, almost those who were not interested in may cons easily consult and verify that it is so, there was a very, there was no um, effort whatsoever to deprive or to convert Muslims to atheism or whatever. The the um, there was a significant reluctance to accept the Catholic Church, but it was a significant encouragement to uh, follow the Christian Orthodox Church, which is what is still now mm -hmm. in Russia. And the there was a department or was a central office of religions who had a kind of supervisory role, whereby, for example, if um, in Turkmenistan, which one of the Islamic republics. They wanted to put four, four mosques in one place within, I'm exaggerating, but sure. uh, in one, within one square mile, then the central office would say, no, there are too many to put them here and then there. But there was no interference per se. In fact, there's Islamic, the Islamic they were, Islamic, Islamic they are. This is part of the, what you ask me, what, how did they do it? They did it not by coercion, because, because there was no coercion, and uh, so it was a, a mode of life that enabled people to essentially do what they wanted. There were times, there were of course waves of uh, where criticism was accepted, waves where criticism was accepted, but that it was nothing as it was at the beginning, which was the, the most traumatic, the most traumatic times 
of, um, of the Soviet Union was soon after the revolution until yeah. 1940. And of course, there, were the, there was the business which is, norm, which is in the history books is listed as the quote-unquote genocide of the Kulaks in Ukraine. But again, um, this has to be seen in a, a slightly different context. But I don't want to make it a monologue, but you are, your question was, how did they do it? There was a structure that would enable uh, various population of various ethnic groups um, to live their own life in the socialist, quote-unquote, socialist system. The problems that we have heard about that were real were at the top because there were severe interpretations, um, differences of interpretation on some of the main uh, directions that the country should take. However, was the country more, uh, more or less secular? There's no state it, religion as such? There was no state religion, but again, it went through waves. And this is, this is why I'm saying, without going, taking an ideological view, totalitarian Stalin genocide is yeah. easy enough, but it really doesn't reflect the whole thing. Sure. The, um, from what I could find, and I'm not the only one to say it, of course, um, the, they were, uh, they were, the, the plan was to start from anew. It was really the, uh, I would say, revolution of the October Revolution was the newest, the most extraordinary ever happening, at least in the recent, in the recent centuries, in that they did not want to change the government. They wanted to change society, which is a very different thing to do. So in order to change society, Lenin, or at least in the writings of Lenin, um, had in mind three stages. It would be the, the first revolutionary stage, which was, you know, they were, all the world was against them, followed by the so-called dictatorship of the proletariat, mm -hmm. and followed by the abolition of the proletariat, and uh, not so much in an egalitarian society that everyone would have the same thing, but it was a changing of the educational structure that starts from, from, from primary school, so that people would be out of the what what is is what you described as patriarchal the patriarchal uh, mode of seeing life, which it's typically of, of all even today. Of all, still religion, you have the father, and you have the God who's the father in in in, in heaven, and so the, the father here and the and the son, and the, so the son follows the father because he's the figure of authority and doesn't question it. And so this is this instinct which is inculcated uh, during infancy with all the connections, the, the repressions that are associated with it. We will go for, speak for a long time. But uh, is induces or causes a mode of life which then follows the pattern that we still follow today. I'm not saying that it's all bad, but it's, we, we're, we are, we're afraid of authority. We, uh, people are even here. So the Idea, the idea was to gradually, with education, to extirpate not religion itself, but the, the patriarchal aspect of the religious feelings. But it is easy to say and difficult to do. So when, uh, when as a whole, if I can generalize, it was, it was uh, found that this elimination of the patriarchal concept was impossible. This, this uh, independence from the uh, idea of a church was in, impossible. So they changed tact. And so the, uh, the Orthodox Church was invited to participate. There was a, the, even although these days nobody thinks they were all against religion. No, religion was actually, if not encouraged, certainly uh, accepted. And particularly the Orthodox religion was actually helped quite a bit. The, uh, United, the, United, the excuse me, Soviet Union helped the um, the orthodox religion to, to almost thrive, we would say. So in all the world, does this, this, um, Stalin fit into this? It's because, again, his, his, his character is a, an interesting one. He's very inter Every person is interesting, as you say in your show. But he has a, had things that we don't think about and they are reading about his life. For example, he was a very avid reader. His, uh, his library, he had a 20,000 book library, which really? is not too bad. And um, he used to read and uh, annotate all the books that he read. And uh, reading what I, uh, quoting what I read, 
there were at least about 5,000 books that had his, his notation. And his interests was, were, were very wide. And this does not appear from, this, from the image that we have of Stalin as we transmit, yes. transmit it. Uh, I will, uh, let me see. I, I quote you an example. One of, one of the interests that were, uh, the Soviet Union did, was, did particularly, was sh shown, or rather had a quite remarkable developments in, in science, as you know, the first, the first, um, the first um, satellite in space, the first man in space, and all mm -hmm. these good things. So this has not just happened by chance. There was a program to make it, all this happen. And one of the interests, there was a very active, very strong uh, education system, and uh, which uh, maybe now still is. However, um, Stalin, one of the uh, interests that he had, he was an interest in lexicography. He was a Georgian, and the Georgian language is one of just just the just the idea of the the character of the Georgian language impossible to understand. But he was yeah. a, he, so. During, unfortunately, during this, as I said, it's not all the positive, but during one of the, um, I would say, waves of certain waves of criticism of the um, of the lexi of the lexical <coughs> of the of lexicog lexicography, came up a certain theory made by a bigwig who was authoritative at the time, against whom all the other academicians, all the other academics, were essentially against. And because the line was the line of this party person was um, uh, pre predominant, all the other ones were either sacked from the universities or or, or, or um, forced to be quiet about it. Now Stalin used, used to receive an enormous amount of letters from everyone, and uh, somebody in Georgia, however, was able to through a friend of his to have to send <coughs> his letter to the personal assistant of Stalin. So Stalin f and, and, um, read it. And he became so interested that he called this Georgian professor, the Georgian lexical language, to his dacha in, uh, in near Moscow. And he called some other people. And uh, that particular, particular meeting lasted until 7 in the morning. To all night with him taking notes and this that just about lexicography. So during during this conversation, the, crit the professor critical of the line of the party as far as lex lex explained to him what happened, and so just on the spot it was about maybe one o'clock in the morning, he calls up the commissar in uh, in this, this commissar for this region which happened to be in Armenia although it, in the Armenia and Georgia. And he asked his comrade, so, uh, I don't remember the name of Comrade Antinov, it was Comrade Antinov, do you know these two guys? And the two guys that he had sacked, they were had sacked. Do you? And the guy says, yes, I know them. And where are they? Well, they are not there at the moment, they are not at their post. So, w well, why did you, why, why are they not at the post? Well, because we have fired them. And so he asked him, this is verbatim, were they accountant that you can fire an accountant and put him to work somewhere else? You were too fast, Comrade Antino, way too fast. At this point, the other comrade was terrified. As you can <laughs> so he called his assistants, uh, his assistants, and immediately during the night, he went to the house of the professor, the, the main professor he had fired, knocks at the door. The, guy, the professor was frightened. He says, Comrade Professor so and so, I just want to tell you that you, henceforth, you are the director of the lexicography program <laughs> for Armenia and for Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> talk about power. Talk, to talk about power. And the other guys said, but couldn't this wait until the morning? The, the guy was terrified, of course. But this is just one of many anecdotes that put a different light on the character. He, he was, um, his mother was Georgian. He, she, uh, she never, she um, uh, was reli religious. He was never, he never much had the time for her. And uh, but when uh, when when she he didn't even when she died then uh, she was she was buried in one of the places. I have an there. impossible task for you. Yeah, the time so is running out. Well, and it's we good because if I I'm glad you stopped me because, <laughs> because when, we, uh, we need to uh, wrap up what you're talking about in the moment for in about sure. three minutes or so. Well, I was saying that the conclusion of this anecdotal and somewhat introductory uh, <laughs> speech or rather narrative is that 
many of these uh, many of these uh, events in the Soviet Union, which then were reflected afterwards, uh, have in what happened afterwards, deserve more accurate uh, analysis and interpretation than normally it is given by the by the. Um, the media and history. It's easier to say he was a totalitarian dictator that killed so many people. Again, th those things should be revised more accurately because he was a man, obviously, and he had his own weaknesses and his own strengths and he was certainly very intelligent and was certainly very dedicated to what he did. After all, the United, uh, Soviet Union won World War II. So, and it wasn't, was not exactly an easy thing to do. <laughs> you should be glad that McCarthy is not around today because you would be on his list. But, but see, but here, here's the issue, the ideology. It's nothing to do to say, I like, I'm, I'm for communism. I'm just saying, let's be objective about uh, examining one person. Because if we apply the principle of objectivity to everyone, we can find something good. Maybe even some McCarthy may have something good, <laughs> who knows? But. This is what I am attempting in my own very small way to say. It's, it's easy to say the guy is a dictator, like well, look at the example. Gaddafi was a dictator. Everybody on the television told the European leaders and they destroyed the country. Same in, same in Iraq, same in Libya, same in Afghanistan. So this is the one, of, I'm saying to conclude, one of the consequences of rush judgment or rather of opportunistic, very of a rough opportunistic judgment to, f to pursue some kind of interest which is absolutely opposite of the people who live in that country and I think in the end to the American people. What, we're changing gears here for sure. a minute. What about uh, President Obama's performance since he has been in the presidency? I think it's a very difficult, uh, I think it's a very difficult task to perform and as we know, and everybody knows, there are so many forces uh, at play behind the scenes that we cannot see. So uh, it would be like judging the weather without without being outside. You know, uh, it would be being in a closed room and say, well, "How is the weather?" I don't know. I would say that he is not worse than the others. Certainly not better. In some things, he did quite a bit worse. One mm -hmm. recently now has done some reasonably good things with the business of. At least not invading Iran, <laughs> but um, but it's still you know we, we have the association with Saudi Arabia. Very complicated matters. I think it would be uh, it would be difficult to cast a judgment. So, in the next presidential election, would you vote for uh, Trump or Hillary or Bernie or would you write my name in? I would write your name in. No, no, I'm serious. <laughs> no, because. I, even 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 Bernie Sanders that everybody likes. I've written an art. There is a blog on my on my website which is quite going quite in depth. He is really is you know is a socialist and you know it's a it's a sort of a um, he is really not a socialist. It's a, it's a, socialist is a good is a good um, popular the populist thing to do. You put some pepper of populism and some salt of socialism. You mix them together and I think that they will stick. Flavorful. But um, I, I think it's absurd. Nothing will happen even if he is elected. I always say the best, best election, best candidate would be the most radical neocon like Pat Robertson, the one who kills everyone who doesn't agree with him. And uh, he's for president too because that would provide the leaven, the yeast for the populace to say, no, we cannot go on like this. And, uh, and something would happen. Not necessarily violent, but, in the, but something that would be radical along the line of what many people would like it to happen. But that will not happen, so I, I... Is what's happening in Bern in Eastern Oregon a precursor or the beginning of a revolt of not the right really. wing in America? I don't think so. I think it's meaningful that they allow them to do what they do, which I'm, at, least, at least there are no dead people, which is good. Um, but no, I don't think so. Those people are fanatics. Mm -hmm. But anyway, they, they try to, they are against wildlife and conservation. You know, it's, I think too many people even, have, even, even in this environment understand that conser conservation you, is an issue. You cannot say, okay, let's kill, let's kill, cut all the trees, uh, graze all the land, kill all the fish and the birds and the water and, and pollute the water and everything else. 
Do you think there's climate change going on right now in the world? Well, I am not a scientist, but certainly from, from my perspective point of view, when I go even here in Oregon, if you go to Mount Hood uh, during the summer, uh, you see <laughs> that the, 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 the glacier is, is, is uh, retreating. retreating. In Europe, uh, on the Alps, during the summer, they have to put now on the main glaciers, they put sheets of metal, you know, reflective metal, huge things in order to prevent them from melting so that they can have something in the winter. So to deny climate change um, is, of course, idiotic. Uh, but to say that it's not man-made uh, is, is rough opportunism because even science is influenced by ideology. So if you pay a scientist, so-called, quote-unquote, that this is, so if, if you say that there isn't happen, I'll give you a million dollars, it will be very, very difficult for the scientists to refuse. We need three more it. hours because I've got more questions to address, okay. but we've got to yeah, well, that's stop good. now. So uh, you just continue to be so enjoyable. Oh, thank you. And I'm talking about I hope we haven't bored you. your stories yeah. and whatever else because of who and how you are. We hope not to have bored your, your well-established <laughs> audience. <laughs> So you have some final words or message or thought to tell to, to the viewers before we before? sign off. Well, you're welcome to, uh, to go to my website. Mm -hmm. uh, you can follow, but by following me, so there's ways of following me um, and follow the website. Not me, but the website, and there is a new article. You can follow me on Twitter, on Facebook, and um, perhaps you can get something from the website and from the historical sketches, which is also online something that uh, may interest you one way or another. All right, well, looks like we better talk about some public service announcements, if you have time for one or two, because, you know, I have a couple of favorites there, Mr. Director. You're going to tell us about the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union. No, you want to watch my shows on the web, Google, Don Baham, YouTube. There's hundreds of shows on, hopefully nearly as good as some of Jimmy's. And there's the ACLU, my favorite, the American Civil Lib Liberties Union. Go to that uh, website and learn more about uh, American civil liberties. And no, oh, I've got to admonish you to be kind and friendly and charitable. Yeah, KFC. To you too. Be kind, friendly, and charitable to you too. Like, <laughs> thanks again for watching. See you later on. <laughs>